we uh, kick off a new series this morning. Uh, it's one that you probably will recognise, uh, but I think it's an incredible opportunity to just remind ourselves of some of the really important things about our faith. Some of us have been doing this a long time, haven't we, Edith? We really have, Judith? John? Just John. <laughs> some of us are doing this a long time, and I think it's really important that we remind ourselves. And for those of you just an alpha, those of you who are just coming into faith and, and everything else, hey, this is a great time uh, to be alive and following Jesus. And this is really a great little series that will help you, we hope, to, to really put some strong legs on your faith. Okay, it's, it's, uh, it's from a, a book called The Purpose Driven Life, a guy called Rick Warren, who uh, for a season was Barack Obama's uh, chaplain. Wow. And uh, what an opportunity, what an influential chap, really. And this, he wrote a book, never realised it would be a number one bestseller. And this is going back a few years now, but his, the truths that are in this book and the way that he explains the Christian faith are, are really helpful. For 40 days, uh, it's possible to read the book and do a day, a, a few pages every day. It's very accessible. If you, want to write, if you want to read it, if you want to buy it, if you want to get it on Kindle, it's entirely up to you. Uh, but it's, it's something I would really uh, suggest is good. If you've got the book on a shelf from about 20 years ago, <laughs> brush it off. It's probably sat next to your Bible. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't use them so much anymore, it's often on, the, uh, on a, a, um, a phone or a tablet, isn't it? But brush it off and, and have another little look at this as we go through the next few weeks, uh, looking at what a purpose-driven life would look like. Do you know the Queen, the King, over the years have given lots of people uh, awards, haven't they, for their service to the community, MBEs, OBEs, and all of that. And lots of people have been deigned and knighted, whatever that looks like, really, in the grand scheme of things. And, and just wonderful uh, the way that, that people like Kelly Holmes, then Kelly Holmes, do you remember Kelly Holmes? And she's often uh, on the TV presenting nowadays, isn't she? And she was uh, awarded her honour mainly because of her contribution to British athletics. I never got one. <laughs> I, I wonder why. I don't want for a bus, do I? Um, but Kelly Holmes was incredible. Many of us, perhaps in the 2004 Olympics, will remember um, her, her journey to victory, shouting at our televisions, willing her to, to cross that line first. And, her, and she, she had an amazing double gold winning performance. It will go down in history as one of the great performances in world athletics. Now, during the week that followed her performances, as you can imagine, lots of stuff in the press, lots of people on telly, and, and, and they all asked what the, the key to her success was. And they all said that for 20 years through childhood and into her personal professional career, she had been driven by the desire to succeed. Through some really dark days of injury and failure, the one thing that kept her going was Pringles. No, it wasn't. It was, that was me. Um, uh, it was her passion for the Olympic gold. Now, the drive of people like Kelly Holmes or Hussein Bolt or Mo Farah over, over the years and lots of folks that, that you might be able to think of, it reminds me of some of the words that the Apostle Paul wrote around 2,000 years ago. He also had athletic imagery in mind when he wrote about what the driving force for his life was. He says this in Philippians 3. He says, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straight towards what is ahead, I press on. Notice he doesn't say I stroll on. He says, I press on. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul was a man of incredible focus. Not focused on achieving a gold medal in an athletic race, I give you, but focused on giving all of his energy and efforts, completing God's plan for his life. Now, he was a highly motivated guy, to, and his motivation was to spread the Christian message around the world and to build uh, strong and healthy churches wherever he went. Paul, he was driven by a, a desire to fulfill God's purpose for his life. Now, I wonder what drives your life? Payday? What drives your life? Promotion? You see, when we use the word driven, we're talking about something that gives direction. When you drive a car, you direct it, hopefully, down the street on the wrong side, right side, yeah. not the wrong side. 
When you use a, a screwdriver, you are directing the screw into the, the, the wood. When you stand on the tee and drive the golf ball, you hope, and I pray in my case, that you direct it down the fairway. And, and apparently for cricketers, um, I'm, I've never played cricket, although Becky played, played cricket in her, her, in her early years at school, you'll, you'll know there is a cricket shot called a drive which actually involves skillfully directing the ball as far away from the field as is possible. Now, whether we are able to identify it or not, all our lives are driven by something. There are certain things that give direction to our lives and, and influence the way that we are. Some people are driven by comfort, aren't they? You know, they're driven by comfort. They steer their life past as many tough situations as possible. Uh, why not? I, I don't disagree with that. They don't tend to put themselves out though either and they make a, a pain-free existence their ultimate goal. Happiness is other people's drive. That, that may be the drive for you. The choices that you make may be based on the level of happiness that you experience. So happiness may be what you're driven by. For some people it's success. Their life is focused on climbing as high as they can to achieve in their career or social ladder. Why not? Approval. Other people love to, to make sure that other people's opinions of them suit them. And they're driven by that. Always trying to please everybody. Popularity, perhaps. Perhaps you make it your aim to be the most popular person in your social group. Parents can often be our drive. Even 20 or 30 years after some people's parents' death, they're still trying to do what their mom and dad would have approved of. You'd be amazed how some people feel that way. And then there's the good old guilt, where our mistakes of the past can control sometimes our future. And that drives us. And then, of course, there's money. Sometimes our money... Is that money is our focus and uh, making as much of it and getting as much as quickly and as easily as we can. I wonder what drives your life. Ask the person you, you know best. What drives my life? Because their answer might be different to yours. Is it food? <laughs> Holidays? Stoke City? Yeah. It pain me just to say it. <laughs> Work? Always thinking of new sermons? Always thinking about the church? Mark would probably say that. I'm always thinking about the church. I wake up thinking about the church. I go to bed thinking about the church. Uh, good in some ways, but negative if it harms any relationship with God and my family. See, it needs to be in the right box, doesn't it, drive? I believe God wants us to be driven people. That we need focus. But driven by the things... Uh, not by the things that I've listed and not driven to the extent that we're exhausted and overstressed and missing the day and the life and the people we journey with, but driven, motivated by God's plans and his purposes for our lives. So, I'm going to get you talking a little bit today. Uh, so, um, over these next few weeks, we don't want you to feel embarrassed in any way. If you prefer to just sit there and think about your personal answer to the question, it's not a problem at all. But if you're willing to just turn to the person around you or just turn around or whatever and just catch two of it, you might want to do it as a family, all right? But just for two minutes, just for two minutes, what drives you? What gives you the greatest fulfillment in life? What motivates you? Makes more? A bit, a bit, a bit. <laughs> what motivates you to get up in the morning? Now, I have to say some mornings it's bacon. <laughs> some mornings it's just food. Uh, just, just, yeah. What makes you make you to get on going? Okay, two minutes. You're good at two minutes now. I know you are. Two minutes. What drives you? What gives you great fulfillment in life? What motivates you to get up in the morning? <laughs> things that went on in those conversations and maybe one or two surprises and that's just amongst the married couples uh, but uh, one or two things that perhaps came to your attention on that but I want to tell you God is a planner 
I'm a planner. Mark's not been very well this week. He's been in hospital. He's doing all right, but um, and uh, but God is a planner. I've got a list of things ready for him when he's up and running already. The list is getting longer. I tell you, I don't know what it is with these fellas that get sick. It's wrong. Um, but God has. God has. I'm sure he doesn't have a list, but he's a planner too. He's a planner. I like planners. The Bible teaches us that, that God has never made anything without a purpose. And that he clearly has a plan in place for everything, all things. There's nothing that God looks at and wonders, oh, why on earth did I make that again? Nothing. Why on earth did I make that? Oh, I didn't have a purpose. Like, why was I thinking in that one? This is what Proverbs says. It says, the Lord has made everything for his own purpose. All things were created by him and for him. God created all things with or for a purpose. He made you for a purpose. Now, I struggle with this concept at times. Let's face it, I, don't, I still haven't worked out wasps. I know that the, the science is starting to work that out. But for years, I've never had a number of wasps. What do they do that is really good or helpful other than scare children, adults, and every other living thing? There may be certain things that we, we question their purpose, but God never does. We're just catching up with him, even on wasps. There is a purpose for everything he creates. So if you're alive this morning, if your heart is beating, then God has a plan and a purpose for you. Jeremiah 29, 11, it's a classic verse, isn't it? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you. That doesn't mean you're going to win or, or have success in everything. But in his eyes, he's going to bless you. Plans to bless you, prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. When you seek me, he says, we almost forget this bit, when you seek me with all your heart. So this is important for us to understand first because the prevailing ideology in the Western world taught us a fact in our schools is that this whole world is one big mistake. That certain gases randomly mixed with other gases and by chance the universe created. And then things have evolved. Now I know they do to a degree, but then things evolved and here we are today, folks. And all this happened without planning. This was just a cosmic accident, without a design, without purpose. Our lives are just one big stroke of luck. You need more faith to believe that Absolutely. than believe what the Bible says. Because this theory has been so widely taught, the idea that there may be a plan and a purpose for people's lives has been stolen from them. You know them. They're in your street, they're in your offices, they're in your families. So many people live without any real sense of purpose. They've been repeatedly told that their lives have just evolved from a random big bang. Now God might have used a big bang, but it had purpose. Amen. It wasn't chaos forming. And when people have no clear purpose in life, it can have serious consequences. During World War II, the Nazis set up a, a camp factory uh, in Hungary where pri prisoners were made to work under Barbar, 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 I've got a problem with my words this morning. Barbarous, barbaric. Thank you, Barbara. Anyway, really bad conditions, really bad. So one day, the prisoners were made to move a huge pile of rubbish from one end of the camp to another. The next day, they were ordered to move it back to its original position. No reason was given, they were just told to do it. So this began a pattern. Day after day, the prisoners hauled the same amount of mountain of rubbish from one end of the camp to the other. And the impact that that made on the prisoners, it, it, was, it was that mindless, meaningless labour, it began to rise to the surface within them. One day, an elderly prisoner began sobbing uncontrollably and had to be led away. Then another man began screaming until he was beaten into silence. Another man who had endured three years of this, every single... We think we've got it bad, folks. I tell you, every single day, rubbish piled from one end of the camp to another, he suddenly broke away and ran towards the electric fence. He didn't care that he was going to die. 
In the days that followed, dozens of prisoners started to go insane. Their captors didn't care, for what the prisoners didn't know was that they were part of an experiment in mental health. The Nazis wanted to determine what would happen if people were subjected to meaningless activity. They wanted to see what life would be like for those who had no sense of purpose. They concluded that the result was insanity and suicide. And the commandment, the, com the commandant even remarked that at the rate the prisoners were killing themselves, there'd be no more use for the gas chambers. This story might be quite extreme, folks, but it clearly illustrates one thing. A sense of purpose is vital for human life. The sad thing is so many people live without a clear sense of purpose. They exist at what you could call survival level. They go to work to pay the bills and they live for the weekend. They have no goals or, or major drive in life. They turn up to work around eight or nine, leave sometime around five, and life is still a bit of a struggle, if not a big struggle. They may occasionally dream of a different life, but nothing comes of it. They just survive without any real purpose. They just exist. Then there are people who live at success level. level. They, they may make a little bit more money. They climb the ladder a little bit higher on their career ladder than those that, that exist at survival level. To many people, they look like they've made it. They have plenty of money to spend on life's pleasures. They live a comfortable life, have one or two good holidays a year. They drive a fancy car, electric even, and live in a smart house. But there is still something missing. Although they appear to have achieved this level of success, there's still something within them that feels un unfulfilled. I'm not just speaking this out of turn, folks. You know. They appear to have everything, yet still carry an emptiness. And then there are people who are living at significance level. These people know why it is they are on that planet. Isn't it good to know why you're on the planet? They live with a clear sense of, of what God has called them to be and do. They, they are secure in their relationship with God. They don't need to impress others. They're not motivated by things that are temporary. And they wisely steward their time, treasure, and talents. In fact, their whole life is revolved around fulfilling the purpose that God has for their lives. They're living eternally significant lives. That's where I want to be, folks. There are times in my life I'm not there, but that's my goal. That's my focus. You see, you may ask, does it really matter? Does it matter whether or not I discover the purpose of my life? Well, I, I believe it really does matter. It's really important. Number one, it affects your life on earth. When you discover what your purpose in life is, it will affect how you spend your time, how you steward your resources, where you invest your money, how you use your skills and your talents. If you are driven by a desire to climb the career ladder and be successful, you will invest all your time and resources into that, won't you? If your purpose in life is to be happy, then you'll put all your efforts into having a good time. If you're driven by making money, you'll, have, you'll give a massive part of your life to increase in your bank balance. And if your purpose in life is to honour God and follow his plan, then you will give your whole life, time, relationships, treasure, talent, to fulfil that eternal plan. I believe that if you know your purpose, it gives some clear direction as to how you manage the rest of your life on earth. Secondly, it affects your life in eternity. It does matter. Now this might sound quite scary, but one day God's going to do a little audit on your life. And mine. He's not going to ask, well, which church denomination did you go to, Ellen? How much money did you make? How many promotions did you achieve? He's not going to ask me how many trophies I won or whether I... I achieved Olympic gold medal. He's not even going to ask me what car I drove, which is a bit sad really, because I do like cars. <laughs> God's questions will be simple and very uncomplicated. 
And there goes something like this. What did you do with my son Jesus? Did you love him? Did you trust him? Did you follow him? Or did you, did you just add your name, his name, to your back? And then you'll ask, what did you do with the resources I gave you, Ellen? What did you do with all that money you made? Inherited your life, probably. <laughs> well, you don't know, do you? What did you do with that money you made? What did you do with these skills and the talents I, I, I birthed in you? What, what did you do with your relationships, your energy? Did, did you make it all about you? You see, I appreciate God is incredibly gracious. But I think it's going to be a little bit embarrassing to get to that point and say to God, well, I never really took time to discover your purpose in my life. I never really took time to use the resources and assess and audit myself regularly so that I could fulfill your plan. I'm sorry, God, but I really didn't take the time to discover why I was here, did I? Too late. Let's turn to one another one more time. Two questions. How specific do you think God's plan for your life is? Because sometimes, I don't believe it's a, I don't honestly believe that um, the direction of my life is like walking on a tightrope with God. He doesn't put you on a tightrope. It's more like track. And within that, I have an opportunity to discover my way forward. And you know when I get it wrong? He just gently brings me around again to what the ideal, the, the God purpose might be. But you know, how specific do you think his plan for your life is? Does it include a specific marriage partner or a specific job or a specific place to live? Is it more general than that? Does he give you choice within that? I think God's big enough, don't you? Do you find it reassuring that God has a plan for your life? Or, or do you find it quite worrying because you might miss out on it? Big questions. But it will also help you understand each other, where you're at, and how you perceive God and his purpose for your life. Can we do that just for a couple of minutes? Might need, a couple, might need two minutes just to read the question again. Um, but let's just take two or three minutes and um, bear with one another. Think quickly. Explain quickly and then invite the other person to talk. Don't just talk at them, all right? Did you agree? You might disagree. That's all right. It's all part of learning, isn't it? Anybody want to share what they think? I thought Debbie's hand went up. <laughs> Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it, how we, we, where we are in our journey with Jesus and, and what we think the answers to these problems. I look, I, when I was in my early teens, late teens, I thought everything had to be very kind of, got to be like this. And by the time I was 23, I needed to be married and I needed to have kids. By the time I was this, I needed a career in the middle of all that. You, you know, and we have these set ideas, don't we? God has a different plan sometimes. You know, he knows the way we take but often his plan is much better, I have to say, looking back. I, I, if, I had my, if I'd gone to my plans, I, I, do, I would not have had the experiences, the, the fun, the joy, the, the growing up, the maturing, the strengthening, the failures, the messes that I've had. Um, but equally, I wouldn't have done life with the people I've done life with. It's been an incredible journey. I'm hoping it's not over yet. I'm only half a century. Half a century. But, you know, I, you know, God has a plan for your life. It may not be quite like yours, but you can guarantee it will be better than anything you could ever imagine or dream. So I, I want to encourage you over the next few weeks, as we walk this forward, next week we're going to remind ourselves that you were made for God's pleasure, not your own. Nobody else's. For God's pleasure, ultimately. And so stick with us. We're going to unpack with uh, what the Word says about that. And, um, and there'll be opportunities to discuss more, little, little bite-sized moments where we can share together and discuss how we're journeying that. There's no right or wrong. Please don't, be, you know, weigh everything that each other says. You know, it's great to hear what, where people are at. 
And not everybody in this room has, has thought this through. We're all on a journey with it. Um, and so just because it's been said doesn't mean it, it weighs up with the Bible, all right? It's just where people are at, and that's okay. It's a safe place. So, for now, ask yourself, what drives you? What is it you are investing your life in for this season, for this coming year? Well, how am I going to respond to God when he asks how? How have you responded to Jesus and how have you used the resources that I entrusted to you? Faithful with a little, faithful with a lot. Let's bow our heads. Thank you for listening so much. Dear God, I, I, I want to know your purpose for, for my life today and tomorrow. There is so much more. So much more that you long to weave in and through our daily, ordinary, everyday lives through your spirit. Father, we want to know very clearly why you made us and why you put us on this earth and what you want us to do. So would you forgive us for looking elsewhere? Would you help us to identify what has driven our lives this far? The good and the not so good. And help us to get it back into balance again. Would you help us to believe afresh that you still have a purpose for our lives. No matter who we are, where we are, and how old we are, we still have a purpose for our lives. Would you fill us with your spirit, Jesus? And would you continue to guide us into all that you have in your hand for us? And so we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um.